Okay. <clears throat> so let's start. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, ISTRC special uh, webinar on urban air mobility. Uh, I'm Jack Haddad from the uh, Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Technion. Uh, I am chairing the webinar today, and I'm very happy to be here uh, with you. Uh, before we start, I just want to share with you some information about the format uh, of this uh, webinar. Uh, so the webinar will be held in English and all the slides of all presentation will be, of course, uh, also in English. Uh, we are recording the webinar as we want to upload it later uh, uh, to the ISTRC uh, website. Uh, we use uh, the Zoom's uh, webinar system. Uh, therefore, you cannot see all uh, participants. Um, but um, the webinar program is shown uh, in the slide, as you can see here. Uh, it includes opening words and presentation from uh, researchers from academia, uh, speakers from industry, and speakers from uh, decision makers in the field. We also uh, invited an Israeli uh, drone company, but unfortunately the speaker uh, canceled in the last minute for an urgent uh, situation. Uh, before the start of each presentation, uh, I will only introduce the name of the speaker um, and uh, his affiliation and the title of the presentation. I will not describe or mention the biography of the speaker, as we don't have much time for that. I believe that everyone can uh, Google or can find on the web um, detailed information regarding all speakers. Uh, during the, uh, each presentation, uh, you can refer a question to the lecturer uh, using the Q&A option uh, that appears uh, in your screen. And at the end of the, each presentation, um, time will be allocated um, to answer a selected uh, question uh, from the audience. Um, I think that's all. So without further ado, uh, I'm really excited to start the presentations. But first, uh, let us start with some opening words uh, by Daniela uh, Guerra Margeriot. Uh, uh, she's a Deputy Managing Director, uh, Smart uh, uh, Mobility Initiative at the Israeli's Prime Minister's Office. So, Daniela, um, please, uh, as you say, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, hi, everybody. Thanks, Jack. I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, so just really very quickly, very excited to, to see you all here for this special um a webinar today on urban air mobility hosted um, uh, by the Israeli Smart Transportation Research Center. Um, my name is Daniela Guerra Margaliot and I'm the Deputy Managing Director of the Smart Mobility Initiative in the Prime Minister's Office in Israel. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with the initiative, uh, I'd like to just take a few minutes to present to you in a nutshell uh, who we are and what we do. Um, so as I said, with the Smart Mobility Initiative, we are in the Prime Minister's Office. And our sole purpose is to promote smart mobility in Israel. Um, we do that by focusing on uh, turning Israel into a leading hub of R&D, knowledge, academia, and industry, and uh, by promoting the implementation of smart mobility solutions in the local market. Uh, over the past decade, we've spearheaded Israel's national plan for smart mobility. Uh, we've created a vast and varied set of governmental tools to help make Israel the international center of knowledge and industry that it is today. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm proud to say that the Israeli Smart Transportation Research Center itself is the outcome of one of our uh, many efforts. So um, I think really just like uh, quickly, I thought it would be maybe useful if I um, highlighted some of our tools that are out there now that we support and I think are very relevant for academia. And if you don't, uh, if you're not familiar with these things, then perhaps you should like uh, check them out later. Um, Generally speaking, uh, and by not a, by any particular order, but we have uh, a pilot and demonstrations program, uh, which supports currently about 60 pilots. Um, we have created two cutting edge consortiums, uh, Avatar and Andromeda, um, which are tackling technological challenges uh, of the autonomous uh, dream. Um, 
I hope you know what a consortium is. It's like when we put together academia and industry and it's supported with a, quite a large budget by the government, uh, tens of millions of shekels over a, a lot, uh, like a few years time. Actually about any one of these, if you need more information, I think you can really ask uh, Tria, who I hope you all know from the center and she'd be happy to give you more information, I'm sure. But um, so we have the consortiums, we have uh, the research center itself. We have um, all the time an ongoing effort to provide more access to open source data and high resolution mapping. We have a project we did uh, two years ago with the Israeli, what's it called, MAPI, uh, Survey of Israel. Uh, if you look at their website, you'll find there are 150 kilometers of HD mapping uh, open for anybody to use. And if you look in the Khatsav uh, of the Ministry of Transport, you'll see more than 90 new data sets have been added over the past two years uh, and many more and um, the establishment of a test center and now a cyber test site uh, is going to be established and uh, constantly leading you know policy and supportive regulation for the sector uh, the topic of this particular webinar is as we said urban air mobility so i added here the uh, naama uh, project logo under sort of in between the supportive regulation and the pilots and demonstrations because um, well you'll be hearing more about it later on from dorb and david but this is a good example of how the government, uh, you know, it's aiming to promote the feasibility of, of air mobility and also the air mobility ecosystem um, by regulation and by pilots and demonstrations, by support of money, and here raising academic challenges and uh, the involvement of academia. So in short, there's a lot going on. Um, that was really just, you know, highlighting everything. It's not the main subject today, so I just wanted to say hi. Um, for more information on what, you know, the government is doing, uh, you can follow us on the social networks. So, you know, Smart Mobility Initiative. And also I suggest uh, if you're interested, um, make a note in your diaries, because in just over a month, we have our annual Ecomotion event. It's on May 18th, and it's a good opportunity to hear a lot about what's going on in the Smart Mobility ecosystem with, you know, an exhibition of like 200 startups and, and uh, lots of interesting stuff, lots of B2Bs and interesting uh, networking opportunities. And later on in the year, uh, we have our annual uh, Prime Minister's Smart Mobility Summit in November. Um, again, uh, I suggest you all uh, keep keep that in mind and uh, I hope to see you there and in other things. And that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Enjoy the webinar and thanks again for inviting me. Thank you very much, Daniela. Uh, and now we move to the first uh, speaker. Uh, it will be given by Professor Costas Antonio from Technical University of Munich. And the title of uh, his uh, presentation is factors affecting the adoption of urban air mobility. So thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. It's uh, great to have this opportunity to discuss about our recent research to the, the this great audience, including many friends. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, special. So the topic as discussed is factors affecting the adoption of urban air mobility. We have been working on uh, the factors affecting the adoption, satisfaction, demand for all emerging modes for, you know, uh, a long time in my group. And of course, being uh, located in Munich, the capital of Bavaria, where is one of the main areas in the world where urban air mobility research is being done, not only research, actual development. Of course, it made sense that we were absorbed and influenced with the many partners and of the ecosystem and move into this uh, region uh, to, to, to this topic. So, of course, the basic idea is there are a lot of people creating different paradigms, different vehicle designs. Some make more sense, some make less sense. And then there are also a lot of uh, ideas about how these uh, will need to be supported from infrastructure. And at the end of the day, these two things have to interact with many other aspects into and determine or foresee the impact on urban mobility. And what we do here is we try to focus on the human factor. We are not looking at the technology side of building the vehicle or necessarily design the vertiports or other types of infrastructure, but what are the, the, the human expectations? And for that, I will not go very deep into any specific uh, item of research, but what I want to do is kind of tell a story and go from uh, uh, over several pieces uh, and then of course whoever is interested I can provide more information or they can look at the uh, references. The first thing will be to look at an extended technology acceptance model and see how the, the, the existing knowledge can be extended to accommodate urban air mobility 
then of course we are talking about a new mode and before we understand how it will fit into the large transportation system and ecosystem we have to understand how people are going to choose it and considering that it's not available and we cannot observe this choice we have to elicit this information somehow and build the models that will give us the input that we can then enter into a simulation framework that will allow us to evaluate different scenarios and look a little bit uh, into the future and finally uh, some of our recent research has to do with looking also at the experts so so far what i described the, the first two points collect data from the general public which of course is great because that's representative but we also can look into the experts and try to understand their viewpoint their insights and at the end try to reconcile everything so i'm not uh, showing the research historically uh, but in a way that i think might make more sense uh, as a storyline so this is uh, the some research that we did uh, with some uh, students of mine and some researchers at the research center Bauhaus Luftfahrt uh, in Munich and we created some scenarios future scenarios where we described trips for example from Munich airport to Dachau which is a city near Munich and then another example from Planeg to Taufkirchen which are like two suburbs of Munich to avoid like the well-connected central areas and we try to describe the story for them so that they can um, understand a little bit a little bit better the setting and then we ask them a number of questions and these questions have to do with perceptions with attitudes here are some examples so for example we write some statements like service reliability on time performance is a very important feature of trusting UAM. I strongly agree, some would disagree, neither agree or disagree, sorry, str anyway, strongly disagree, some would disagree, and so on. Uh, uh, the third one, I should be able to talk to an operator on the ground at any time. These kind of questions to try to, to, to understand how the, uh, what is important by the potential users of the system. And then we analyze this data, uh, in this case with factor analysis, the, the statistics do not matter right now, I'm not going into equations and, and uh, math, I'm just looking at the concepts. So we group together, we did this factors analysis, first of all on the respondents' perceptions, and then on the social attitudes and behaviors. And these were mapped into a number of factors, which we later interpret. So for example, from these statements the responses on the party on the respondents on their perceptions these are mapped into four factors the one is value of time savings the other is affinity to automation the other is data and ethical concerns and the last one is safety concerns and similarly for the social attitudes and behaviors the four factors that they were mapped to are affinity to online services because you know we expect that people will book a ride on UAM with their smartphone environmental awareness because something that flies presumably uses more energy than something that rolls on the road affinity to social media and affinity to sharing and then we use this information we use these factors as explanatory variables in the development of discrete choice models, models that describe the behavior of the, the, the state and the expected behavior of the users. I will not go into the interpretation of the model. For some of you, this might make sense. For some of you, it might be kind of uh, new. But the point is that we are trying to correlate the ability, the, the tendency of the respondents to use UAM immediately, so in the first year or in the second to third year or in the fourth to fifth year or after the sixth year, fifth year of uh, uh, implementation. And we're trying to see how the various factors influence this decision. So for example, we see that people with a higher affinity to automation 
have a higher tendency to join the system, to use the system in the first year. And then people who have, again, affinity to automation are somewhat less likely to use in the years two to five. And of course, much less to use after six years uh, and so on. And we mapped this into the so-called technology acceptance model, which is a model that tries to, to, to link the behavioral intention, the intention of using a new technology with the various uh, attitudes and perceptions. And this technology acceptance model is not something very new. It has been developed in the 1980s. It had already been extended to the automation acceptance model uh, in the early 2010s by researchers in the field of uh, transportation. And then we extended it to urban air mobility, which has the component of automation. It's expected that it will play a role, but also some additional components. And here we see, for example, the biggest difference was that we had to add this component here about trust and value of safety. So obviously the fact that people will be driven around in a flying autonomous vehicle makes these considerations more significant, more important. And it's important therefore for us as researchers and developers, policy makers uh, working in this field to, to try to address them preemptively to ensure success. Now, of course, we also need simulation and uh, simulation is helpful in evaluating various scenarios. And this is uh, based on the research of a PhD researcher of mine, Raoul Rothfeld, who is, has submitted his PhD. So he developed this kind of uh, simulation framework uh, for urban air mobility. And uh, one of the main things that we need to add is the mode choice component. So we can model how urban air mobility will operate, how the vertiports will work, access, etc. But there are aspects like mode choice where we need insight from the potential users. So for this, we did another analysis, again, in collaboration with Bauhaus Luftfahrt, another master's thesis of uh, Meng Ying Fu with the co-supervision of Raoul Rothfeld that I mentioned before. And here we created a stated choice experiment, stated preference experiment, where we had a number of options, including, of course, private car, public transport, but also autonomous taxi and autonomous flying taxi. And again, we created different scenarios that are realistic uh, and consistent with what is expected. And we allowed the respondents, we presented the respondents with a number of them, and they were able to choose which one they would choose or none, none of these. And yeah, we analyze the data. You now we don't really, I don't wanna go into the detail of uh, what the, the preferences of male versus female respondents or how the age or educational level or income levels affect the responses. Hint, it is consistent to expectations, thankfully. Then we developed again some models that I will not go into the detail of explaining the coefficient of each of these, these are available in the references. Somebody can later look at the presentation and follow these references or just contact me and I can send you the references. What is interesting often in such models is to try to look at the value of time and try to see if this makes sense. And in general, we see that it does make sense. And in fact, the value of time for car and public transport is relatively, is you know, not low, it's consistent with expectations maybe we could expect the value for private public transport to be lower than the one of the car but it's okay and then for automated taxi we see a higher value of time which kind of makes sense and for the autonomous flying taxi considerably higher which makes more sense and gives us an idea gives us a hint of what we can expect right that this is most likely something for more affluent uh, the more affluent population and so on. Now, uh, we were uh, 
lucky to, to get some funding from the Bavarian uh, government to do the feasibility study for urban air mobility for uh, Upper Bavaria a couple of years ago in 2019 in collaboration with uh, the, the Technical University, Teha Ingolstadt and uh, the University of Applied Science of Ingolstadt and Bauhaus Luftfahrt. And we integrated all these research components into a large matching model of the entire area a larger area, a metropolitan area of Munich, including also Ingolstadt, which is one of the big UAM cities for Europe. And we did a lot of analysis that right now, again, I, I don't want to go, I, that could be, a, each of these could be a single presentation. But when we look at the results of a number of scenarios from this, we did at the end, we, we used five scenarios we called A, B, C, D, E. Here we are focusing on three of them. The most pessimistic one, A, the medium one, C, and the most optimistic, the most like where everything goes well for urban mobility. So, you know, we have high density of a network, speed, very high speeds, it's free, uh, very large uh, fleet size, etc. And we see that under all of these conditions, urban air mobility is not expected to be more than taxi, roughly, in Munich. So not more than 1.2% of the mode share of trips, more than 1.6% of the mode share of kilometers driven, and realistically much less than that. So this kind of helps us understand, and I, when we talked at the final presentation of the project, the people from the ministry were very happy because they were like, okay, now we have kind of a realistic uh, idea of how, what we can expect. Because at some point there were people saying, yeah, it's going to re replace public transport. We don't need subways anymore because we're going to have the UAMs flying. I mean, UAM has a role and can, may have a role, but obviously, again, personal view, somewhat corroborated by the research that, that we did, but I believe that we did it uh, very objectively, it's not going to replace to replace buses and uh, subways. And now the last part is the part to incorporate some uh, the experts' view as well. And we developed a Delphi study, and that was with uh, a master's thesis, a master student from uh, Arvedeha Aachen, and uh, a, a doctoral student of mine. And uh, she created, or we did a, a, a Delphi study with two rounds uh, where we asked a number of experts, first of all, uh, with kind of a more open kind of questions, actually that's written here. So we had 51 experts for the first round, out of these 37 completed the second round as well. In the first round, we had mostly open-ended questions and exploratory questions, and this resulted in the identification of 16 challenges, five benefits, eight use cases, and 13 hazards related to UAM. And then we organized this information into the second round, where we had a more structured questionnaire with Likert scale questions, where the respondents were asked to rate the use cases, as well as give us their insight about the probability of the occurrence and impact of the various hazards. And just to give you an idea, this is the breakdown of the 51 uh, experts from the first round are long product owners, policy makers, consultants, investors, researchers, and others. And here, uh, roughly an idea showing that we had a fairly good global coverage that was not focused only in Munich or in Europe. And in the end, the results of this analysis, which again could have been, you know, uh, the duration of this webinar, this presentation or the entire webinar, but I just go very specifically to some things. We analyzed in, the, in terms of the use case in two axes, in an axis of complexity and an axis of anticipated benefit, where complexity was a weighted average of items like community acceptance, infrastructure requirements, regulatory framework, affordability, intermodality, and political acceptance. Acceptance and anticipated benefit was a weighted average of economic gains for industry and the impact on the quality of life of the citizens. 
And we see here four quadrants. In general, the best case is to have high anticipated benefit with very low complexity. And the best case scenario is medical and emergency services. Okay, good. Here we can work with that. Defense applications, it's getting kind of hot, okay. Uh, and then airport shuttles. Then we have a number of use cases that have a high anticipated benefit, but high complexity. And then we have also a quadrant of two cases that have low anticipated benefit and you know, relatively high complexity. So maybe not very high priority. And then the last thing is to talk about the uh, risk matrix, uh, to talk about the probability of occurrence of uh, uh, the risks on the y-axis and the impact on the viability of passenger UAM on the uh, x-axis. And here we also see what, uh, what the risks are and how these risks can affect us. Um, with that, I would like to complete uh, so that we can also leave some time for uh, discussion. Thank you, Costa. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, let me check if there is uh, there are any questions. Uh, meantime, uh, meanwhile, I would like to ask one question, please. So in one of your slides, uh, maybe number eight, when you have this block related to uh, trust and value of uh, safety. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you mean by value of safety? Does this include network oriented features like cyber attacks, people how understand cyber attacks or afraid from cyber attacks, failure in communication and etc. How you define value of safety? It's in slide eight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, trust and value of safety, yes, in this book. Yeah, so this includes many of these, uh, all these uh, aspects. So we have, uh, for example, the perceived vehicle safety, but also the reliability of automation is also an aspect of safety. It, and the, it has to do, for example, the... Um, uh, so cyber attacks are also a part of this. There is also the physical safety of being attacked by somebody else because you are matched into a vehicle, in a shared vehicle, potentially with other riders that you do not know uh, if you accept. So all these are included. This figure is conceptual. Okay. The precise, the precise uh, link can be found here. So for example, in terms of the safety concerns, we see that these two are linked directly to the operator on the ground and to the in-vehicle safety cameras. So it seems that considering that we are talking about a vehicle that is autonomous, the important aspects uh, from, the, from the responses were that it is important to have an operator, so to have in-vehicle safety cameras so that somebody can uh, uh, supervise this and also the operator on the ground. And this somehow links to also, so we did similar analysis and similar models for automated public transport. And one of the things that is discussed there is, oh, the personnel cost is zero, okay. but because we remove the driver, but that's not necessarily true because we might need some people in a control room that cannot monitor 1000 vehicles, UAA flying yes. uh, yes. AVs or whatever, but maybe 10 each. So then we might have some to consider. So this information provides insights also to things like that, I think. Okay. Uh, by the way, you have, also, you, are, you have also cybersecurity. Uh, it's in the fifth or sixth uh, fear of cybersecurity. Anyway, we, we yeah, want- but it goes into, yeah. so, but it goes into another, factor. It in the end, to another factor, you see, okay. the data and ethical concern. Okay, okay. So we have uh, two questions, so maybe we can- uh, so one question from Zev Shadmi is, how will people reach the takeoff site from their home? Probably he meant in the simulation or in general, I'm not sure. But how will people reach the takeoff site from their home? Okay, so, I mean, again, this, uh, this is not, this has to do with the design of the vertebrates and design of the systems. So in general, there, it, when, people, when people design vertebrates, they consider very much 
the location of the vertebra that it has good uh, interaction with public transport. Uh, that's the best way with vehicles. It can be problematic because you have the, you need the parking facilities and so on. The access to the ground, I have some very interesting uh, uh, slides, but I didn't want to, to, to make this heavy, where we see, for example, for Munich, which has a very good, uh, actually, let me see. We have one minute have more, one. if you can. Yeah, 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 I'll do it very quickly. So you can see still, right? Yes. So for me, this is uh, very interesting because we see, for example, for that for the if we have two scenarios, the so-called slow UAM scenario. Uh, ah, no. Okay. The slow UAM scenario. Then we for because Munich is very well connected, UAM does not offer benefits over the other modes of transport. Only if we have a very fast UAM scenario where we have flights of 250 kilometers per hour and seven minutes of access to the vertiport, then we have mostly a reduction of travel time for most of this. So this is very important, I think, to, to consider. It's a very good question. And there's another question if I have time to yes, answer. Yeah, what yeah. Software? Are, no, about not the software before this, are defense applications really part of urban air mobility? Our experts included them, so we have to report them. This is from Vasilis uh, Agoridas. Agoridas. Yes. Hi, Vasilis. And the last yeah. uh, question is regarding the software. What software used for, uh, for the simulation? Did you consider collision avoidance in this uh, simulation? So this is done in uh, Matsim. And uh, for us, that is not the point. So the point here is not to do tra trajectory planning and so on for the UAVs. We model what we need in order to be able to have these realistic and meaningful results. But of course, we make assumptions and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not to the level of detail of looking at the, all the heights and all the collision avoidance and what happens if there is a lot of wind and so on. We have to simplify some aspects and focus on what we need for the big picture. Okay, yeah, thank you. Later on, we might see something related to uh, trajectories and collision avoidance. So, Kosa, uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we thank move you. to the next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, so, the next speaker is giving uh, by, uh, it's Roni Zahavi. He's the CEO of Ferrontali, and uh, the topic of his presentation, uh, title of his presentation is Exploring Areas of Interest for Academic Contribution uh, in UAS, sorry, US and UM uh, domains, present and future. So, Ronnie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jacques. Uh, I have to say that I couldn't have uh, wished myself a better presentation ahead of me than the one given by Constantinus. Thank you very much, Constantinus. I think uh, my presentation in many aspects is going to be a direct continuation to what you have presented. And uh, as you were talking, I could not avoid seeing a lot of uh, overlapping and, and a lot of interfaces that probably down the stream uh, we could explore uh, in our joint work. So uh, really like uh, Jacques said, uh, I think part of the reasoning behind this webinar is to get the research um, community uh, get it, being introduced into the comprehensive ecosystem of this new issue. One of the things, th these are four main topics that I would like to discuss. The first one is, uh, I strongly believe that uh, urban air system, urban air mobility, whatever you want to call it, is a completely new reality. And it's a reality that is very, very fast growing, uh, much faster than uh, probably the ecosystem could really anticipate it when it just started. Uh, I will be discussing a couple of the characteristics, uh, the highlights of the characteristics of this reality. And then we can discuss how we can incorporate research into the game. And uh, being a very, very strong multidisciplinary domain, I think nearly every faculty, every researcher, in every domain or dimension could find his own spot within this new reality. 
And not only could he find it, but I strongly believe that unless we cooperate and bring everybody to, uh, around the table, it would be very difficult to anticipate what this reality is going to look like because obviously a couple of dimensions are going to be missing. So we need everybody. And uh, the last thing I'll be talking about is what I called comprehensive simulation, which goes hand by hand with what Constantinos has presented. And I call it a joint tool because I think at the end of the day, it should address all the stakeholders together. So um, like most of the presenters here can feel there's a lot to talk and a very short time to, to cover everything. So we need to talk very quickly and obviously leave a couple of things for further discussion. So discussing the characteristics of this reality, um, we're introducing a whole new paradigm and we have to look at it in terms of an ecosystem, a comprehensive ecosystem that brings together a lot of stakeholders that need to work jointly together and in a complementary way. Uh, we should see a couple of those, but unless we look at it in a comprehensive ecosystem way, uh, then we may get to um, not very accurate uh, deductions or conclusions, which is not a good thing to do. Uh, and find it out as we go along, and that would be a bad idea. As, as long as we can anticipate things in advance, then obviously it's going to be better for everybody. Um, there's going to be a substantial presence. Um, usually when you talk about a new reality, I don't know if you talk about healthcare industry or agriculture industry or many other industries where you have a lot of new innovation and new uh, uh, ideas that are coming, the mass is not that big as what we talk here, and I should show you a couple of numbers, but we talk about something that is growing in such a huge volume rate that uh, it's going to be all over the place. And we talk about thousands of thousands of thousands of, 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 of vehicles of all kinds, of all missions that are going to live together. So it's going to be very substantial in terms of its presence, generating a very substantial field of gravity that will attract every domain into the game. Uh, we talk about a high diversity of functionality, so uh, we need to address those. Uh, if we talk about urban air mobility around the urban environment, it's completely different than UAVs that are going to be used for agriculture or are going to be used for utility inspection or for fire control or for other things. Each of them has its own functionality, each of them has its own requirement. And, and not all of them uh, are complementary in that sense, and we need to see how they work together. So it's a very multidisciplinary domain. Uh, we talk about communication, we talk about electricity, we talk about fuel, we talk about uh, the grid, where they take off from, where they land, how we talk about the batteries and how we talk about the sensors. And, and it's a very, very multidisciplinary domain that, and, and all those, disciplines are being advanced at the same time. Uh, as I said, they're going to be all over the place. Uh, we have different stakeholders. So we have the government and we have the municipality and they have the uh, civil aviation authority and we have the police and we have the academia. We need to develop human capital and skill force and, and each of those look at it from a different angle. And, uh, and again, we need to address all of those together. And part of the problem, which is, uh, and, and this is something uh, I'll, I'll highlight it in a different slide, but it's very unique to, that, uh, to, to, to the drone industry as a whole, is that we are experiencing what I call the technology users shortcut. And that's part of the problem that a lot of things are not coming from the regulator down, but they're coming from the users up and the regulators are lagging behind and trying to keep the pace, which is not a natural thing, uh, as I said here. So the ecosystem is sort of lagging behind. If we multiply all those components together, we realize that we talk about new reality with very high complexity. And the question is, how do we carry on? This is just an example and I let the callouts pop by themselves. And you can actually see that uh, nearly every point you touch, uh, there are a lot of things that are uh, a lot of technologies. Some of them are completely different to the others. A lot of conceptual uh, operational approach, a lot of new disciplines that need to be addressed. 
uh, from autonomy to transportation to power unit and flight control and safety and lift concept for the engines, human factors. Um, this is a very fascinating thing. For example, people are going to be sitting in it. Uh, how are they going to feel? Nobody's sitting and actually driving it because it's autonomous, but uh, it's not on the ground. So it uh, there is bank angle and maneuvering, and it's going to be sometimes during the night in the dark. Uh, people could feel silk. So there are a lot of human factors and human engineering and navigation. You can really look at it and say, even if you look uh, at the bottom right, there are a lot of new professions here. Who are going to qualify them? Who are going to be the mechanics? Who are going to be the controllers? Who are going to be all the people around it? We need to think about it. We need to think about how do we qualify them? How do we make them skilled? Uh, and this is whole part of the comprehensive ecosystem I talked about previously. This is a slide just to talk uh, very shortly about the numbers. Uh, I'm not talking about the money, I'm talking about the numbers. And it doesn't matter whether it's 15,000 or whether it's going to be 12,000 or 17,000. We talk about a lot. Uh, and in 2035 and, and definitely down the road, we're going to meet tens of thousands of those uh, vehicles from uh, micros, micro drones to large UAVs, and, and it's going to be substantial to our life. It's going to be there. It's going to, it's going to be part of our daily life. And we need to think about it in everything we do. I mean, if you think about city planning and architecture, <clears throat> they need to take this into account in their design of a new city. Especially when we talk about mega cities, it becomes to be very, very substantial. And here we have uh, probably a partial list uh, of the main functionalities that we're going to meet. And uh, these are all civilian, the non-military non ones, from firefighting, search and rescue, border patrol, local enforcement, conservation management, all the way to commercial things like agriculture, mapping, asset inspection, and mobility of people. Each of them uh, bring together a whole set of technologies, uh, different sensors, different uh, loads, different payloads, different requirements in terms of altitude, speed, uh, carrying capability, navigation capability. Each of them is going to be completely different. And in order to, to enable those, uh, you need to develop new technologies in, in various domains. And, and uh, currently things are being very sporadic, uh, but how do you try to plan this ahead? Uh, like if you think about the aviation industry, which was very well organized from the 30s, from the beginning of the 20th century and, and in the past hundred and something years, it was built very gradually. And, and it was hand by hand with qualifying the skilled people from pilots and cockpits and flight controllers and mechanics and so on and so forth, plus the regulations and standardization and training facility and, and, and the technology of the platform themselves. So the whole ecosystem was developed in a very coherent and cohesive way, which is very different than the situation we have right now, where part of the ecosystem is running very quickly and developing very quickly where a lot of startups and a lot of great ideas are being implemented. But on the other hand, things like regulations and research in the academia and laboratories are lagging behind. So we need to address that. Uh, if you look at that table, um, what do you have on the top? Uh, you have disciplines. So you can actually see over here uh, things from um, you can see things like uh, uh, aeronautic engineering, mechanical engineering, electronic engineering, uh, computer science, civil engineering, cybersecurity, environmental, medical science, AI, uh, all the things that are related to geography and geodesia and chemical, chemical industry that is related to refueling and batteries, industrial engineering, physics, and probably many, many, many more. And if you look at the left side, uh, you can see things like uh, command and control for all those drones. How do you do that? How do you generate common language? So if one drone uh, needs to fly at 1,700 feet and somebody else is required to fly at 1,700 feet, are they using the same language? Are we talking over the land? Are we talking over the sea level? Uh, are we using WGS-84? 
Are we using any other things? What kind of uh, GPS are we using? Are we flying without GPS? Uh, so common language is a major, major issue. Uh, how do we make this entire ecosystem cyber resilient? Uh, I've been engaged quite a lot with the cyber resilience in the automotive industry, and that's a big issue. And especially when we come to talk about safety, uh, we must make this ecosystem resilient. Uh, and we see a couple of examples in a minute. Uh, we talk about, about the noise pollution. If you think about hundreds, if not thousands of those vehicles flying over the ground, um, what kind of noise are they going to uh, generate and, and how is it going to be complementary with the daily life of people and, and Constantinus, as I understand it, is dealing with part of these aspects. Things like batteries and fuel cells, things like decision making, which is a lot of artificial intelligence and those systems are going to be autonomous. And obviously, there are a lot of incidents like emergencies. So one of these vehicles suddenly has an emergency. Does that influence the entire environment because it has a, a priority? There are people inside. Uh, they need to find a landing spot. So they need to be prioritized compared to everybody else. Like today in aviation, if, one, if, if an airplane around the airport is suffering or experiencing an emergency, automatically there is a flight controller that will uh, uh, make room for this airplane to land safely. So who is going to make those decisions? Uh, how is the recharging grid is going to work? Robotics, uh, communication and, and IFF, uh, identification of friend and foe, who is who? Uh, things like electromagnetic radiation. We talk about a lot of airplanes in a very close proximity and they're all radiating at the same place. They're flying between two buildings. So there are a lot of reflections, radars. So how is that going to work? Uh, Man-machine interface and many, many others. If you, if you try to fill the table, then you suddenly realize that the various disciplines within the faculties or within the researchers, each of them has something to do with one of those aspects. Uh, so I'm not sure that currently uh, universities and researchers, institutions are aware of all those disciplines that need to be addressed. And uh, we need to bring them around the table and say, okay, we talk about people that talk with cybersecurity and they need to talk together if we talk about cyber resilience with people who are developing the communication systems or the radar systems or, 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 or some of the command and control systems to make sure that they are working together and they're gonna be resilient. So if you think about the regulator from their point of view, uh, we need to think about filling that table and see that each discipline uh, in a way is affecting other disciplines. So how do we bring all those people around the table and, and generate forums that's gonna be, for example, cyber resilient forum and safety forum and emergency decision-making forum and so on and so forth. And, and for each forum, you, bring, you need to bring people from all of the disciplines and see that they are developing the right solutions. Some of them are gonna to be to implement current technologies but some of them will need completely new uh, technologies to be uh, developed uh, from the very early embryonic point of research at the academia for technologies that will be available only down the stream in three, four, five years time. So if you think, if we say the term, they're all over us, you can see a couple of examples here. If we talk about industrial zones, you have a lot of drones, industrial zones, uh, in Israel, we have Perceptor, for example, who are currently providing autonomous drone-in-box solution that will go around the pipes, look for leaks, go look for uh, 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 damages that are happening in some of the machines. But then, so we need to develop the sensors. Uh, they need to be able to fly around tall obstacles, a lot of safety issues, chemical issues. Um, there's a lot of business privacy because those drones are carrying sensors and they are flying all around. They can, obviously, when we talk about Industry 4.0, they can implement Trojan horses and other uh, malwares because in terms of cybersecurity. There is an EMI radiation in some of the industries, uh, depends on the nature of the industry. The same for agriculture when they need to fly around birds. Uh, mission duration, uh, flying at night, functional agility, because sometimes they need to work here, sometimes they need to work there. Uh, if we talk about, uh, you know, 
flying around the beach for some of the missions. Uh, we have privacy issue. We have weather issue. Uh, we have a lot of flying objects like kites and balloons and, and many other things. So each of those has their own challenges. And, and once we realize the magnitude of the problem, then the regulator will need to set standardization and policy that need to be followed in each of those environments, because otherwise it won't work. Uh, we obviously have different stakeholders. Uh, we have the operators of the drones, we have the air navigation services providers, we have the data services providers, uh, we have the service suppliers of the, of the entire system, communication system providers for navigation, communication. So there are a lot of uh, stakeholders that need to be considered. I made this chart just to show uh, what is one of the problems with the industry of drones. Uh, what you see over here is that uh, uh, you have on the top uh, technology and research that usually are working together and bringing new ideas and, and, and innovations in technology. And when, once it gets to the regulator, then the regulator is uh, usually in charge of doing three things. The first one, uh, if we go upwards to the left side, if you can see my, my uh, sign over here, the regulator many times will be investing in, in research facilities to enable both the researchers and the technological people to, to, to check and test their, their, their new ideas. The regulator will obviously activate the standardization authorities, uh, each country for its own, some of them are going to be global. And uh, the regulator will then be in charge of developing the local infrastructure in the country starting with things like developing skill forces, uh, physical things like, I don't know, if we're talking about cars, you cannot use your car unless you have the roads and you have the traffic lights and you have uh, uh, the mechanic and support, the infrastructure and maintenance. We have the network. We have to define what's the nature of the, of the legal and, and so on. And only having all those in place and assuming there's going to be a business reasoning behind it and OEMs that are taking this and turning this into a business, uh, it comes to the user. But guess what? When we talk about drones, uh, this is what it looks like. So uh, uh, you really don't need anything because you buy from the supplier the drone. You can fly it by yourself, even if there is no legal uh, policy, if there is no network, because especially for line of sight uh, operation, you don't need anything. You don't need any physical uh, national infrastructure like roads or railways or railways or airports or anything. And you can do it by yourself. You don't need anybody. And suddenly we have this very sh uh, quick shortcut. And before you know it, you have thousands of those flying all over the place with, with no ecosystem behind them. So if you compare it to this, we need currently, the situation is that uh, the, the, the ecosystem, the regulator and everything, and this is, will be uh, reflected in, uh, in um, Drawer's presentation about NAMA, is to see how the regulator is trying to take an already existing situation in reality and try to bring it into space and make sure that the regulation is there and the ECO are dealing with this and the Europeans and the FAA and everybody is currently dealing with this. Um, I'll dedicate my last three, four minutes uh, to talk about something which I, I believe that we won't be able to, to really make a major uh, a, a step forward without it. And that's a comprehensive simulation. And what you see over here is a simulation that uh, in Hebrew we say simulato uh, marachti, which really takes models into it physical models, aerodynamical models, policy models, all the models you bring in. And this is the only way in which you can really not only design, but test hundreds, if not thousands of entities operating together in a way that you try to look if there are conflicts or not. Uh, one thing to say, and uh, I guess somebody will ask me these questions about, uh, this is very complex. Uh, but the right, the, the way to, to implement it is obviously in the modular way. So you have to all build it in a modular way, like a Lego, in which you can always add in, in an open resource, you can, open source, you can add in more and more models into it. 
Now, since I don't have much time and I can dedicate a whole presentation only for that, I would like to give an example when I've taken the, I took the, 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 the challenge of, this, of the noise. So imagine that you have these simulators and you define what the mission is gonna be. So in this sense, it's gonna be UAM, like Constantino so was using, uh, and delivery. Uh, these are two missions that we're gonna use in the urban environment. Uh, we can anticipate the number of vehicles that are gonna fly at the same time. What is gonna be the time of day, uh, the day of the week. Uh, we can identify the authorized flight path over the city. We bring into it physical models, like the noise model for selected platform. Each of those platforms has its own noise model that will be implemented using the simulator. We can select the uh, specific navigation routes, availability over Munich or whatever it's going to be. Um, and we run the simulation based on some, on some infrastructure like policy that we start with, regulation we start with, WGS84 or whatever we're going to use. We run it and obviously we're going to get some conflicts. The users, the, the customers of this simulation are written here and maybe there are even more. So we bring an optical engineers that will put the propeller design over here in the noise model. We have the civil engineers that define the noise propagation uh, and the acoustic considerations. Uh, and for example, there is a conference hall in the building. And one of the things that we would like to see is, is there a conflict for noise that enable a conference or a concert or whatever it's going to be. Uh, we bring the civil aviation authorities, they need to put the policy verification in terms of where do you fly, when do you fly, how many can you fly at the same time, what altitude you fly, is there any restricted flying zone, and so on and so forth, Ministry of Transportation, the municipality, and so on. Once we run this couple of times, and you see I put your runs one to N, it could be many of those, because once we identify a conflict, we can then change the policy, and we can run it again. So we can use this, for example, to develop the whole new propeller, like in submarines that will be with blades that have a lot of a high efficiency of lift versus RPM. This is, a, this is how you initiate through this simulator a whole new research within the aeronautical engineering department for developing new propellers for the future drones. And, and there are many others. I, I mean, I'll let your imagination work for you, but at some point, you see the regulator can say, okay, we would like to try and enforce a new regulation or a new policy. And once we get to the point where the conflict has been resolved, we say, okay, now we know what we need to implement uh, in that aspect. For example, we can, try, we, we, we can put here, as you can see, wind conditions. So if the wind condition, obviously that inf impacts the, the noise uh, down below. So, if, if you want to check all those reality scenarios in an authentic uh, environmental conditions, and we talk about hundreds, if not thousands of those flying together, I don't think there is any way you can actually do this without having such simulator that will run and enable you to visualize what things are gonna really look at, including all the disciplines together. And again, it's gonna be built in years because it's modular. So, uh, I have a very short time, so I'll finish here. I'll be more than happy to take questions from the floor if you have any, but uh, that was a lot of food to thought, a lot of things to think about uh, going on. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Rooney. I mean, uh, it's a very interesting um, presentation. I mean, you, you presented a lot of, you raised a lot of important questions and you presented a lot of domain and uh, very complex system. Actually, I was a little bit uh, concerned uh, during your presentation that uh, we need to do a lot of things uh, in this uh, area in order to solve all uh, question raised. And then you present this uh, simulator with a modular uh, uh, way of uh, dealing uh, with this complex system. So my question is, uh, the system, I mean, in the simulator, you have some blocks. Uh, these blocks are not, uh, still are not developed. So I think first you should develop these blocks. Afterwards, you combine them as one simulator, no? Or how do you think yeah. it should be yeah, done? That's a good point. Um, I have to start with, a po I, I have to say that I forgot uh, to, to present myself, uh, <laughs> Jacques, you, 
you advise that everybody will present themselves, but I just say that I was deeply involved with a simulator of that nature in, a, in, a, in one of the projects I was engaged with uh, within the Israeli Air Force when I was the head of the UAV branch. Uh, so I know where I'm coming from and I know it's possible. It's definitely true what you're saying. We need to identify a couple of things before we start. The first one, we need to map all the stakeholders and we need to understand what the interest of each and every one of them. And then we need to address and map the potential customers uh, uh, to, to be able to make sure that we satisfy what they need to accomplish their task. And then we can prioritize what we're going to do first. And as we do this, we start with phase one, what the blocks that are going to be there in the phase one. Uh, in parallel for that, I would be very keen to understand exactly like uh, the work that Konstantinos was presenting, what is currently available in terms of simulation all over the world and how those simulators can work together. What I envision is that if we can generate some kind of uh, standard API in which we can bring together simulators that already exist in various places in, in research centers around the world, we can make them work. And, and the way I look at it, it's going to be a national or international infrastructure where everybody can get connected and say, I would like to block something to test this and, and they will get the time availability and the right configuration for them to test whatever they want to test. Sorry, we don't have much time, but there is another question. So if you can quick, uh, very fast, are the conflicts uh, always resolved with pragmatic, realistic policy in, uh, interventions, not theoretical ones by Vasilis? Uh, absolutely, they have to be resolved. Uh, think about any other ecosystem that you're aware of, they are resolved, not to the satisfaction of everybody. Some will be very frustrated but uh, we have to resolve them. We resolve traffic jams, we resolve situation around airports, we resolve a lot of things. So we have to do that, but we have to understand what the price is gonna look, is gonna look like. Okay, thank you, Ronnie, very much. So now we move to the next uh, speaker, actually uh, two speakers. Uh, it will be given by uh, Professor Alfred of Freddy uh, Brookston and his student, uh, David uh, Duvrat, and the title of his presentation is, uh, their presentation is Designing Swarms uh, of Autonomous Drones. So the floor is- on. Hello, hello everybody. I am uh, I'm joining you from far away in the north, uh, near the Golan Heights, uh, but uh, I wanted to, to participate and be with you. Dave Dovrat is going to be the mo uh, to give you the, the majority of the technical stuff. I'm going to, to do a short introduction. So I'm going to talk about swarms of autonomous drones. And this was something that I dreamt about a long, long time ago, and it's slowly coming to, uh, through through a series of uh, masters and PhD thesis. So um, drones are today a maturing technology and for us in computer science, they are agents that are mobile and they are agents that are mobile this time in 3D. So all these people who are dealing with robotics who did uh, work on 2D, now we have a third dimension to deal with. Uh, these, these forms nowadays, as they are maturing, they are becoming uh, better at doing self-location. Uh, they are equipped with vision sensors and other proximity sensors. And they have lots of types of robotic actuators, which enable them to carry payloads and to, to do all kinds of uh, things in the environment. They can move and act both indoors and outdoors. And they are usually guided by some skilled uh, operators. And we have uh, seen, we are seeing recent developments in which they, uh, these drones are getting greater auto uh, autonomy. Uh, they have more uh, sensors and more uh, actuators on them. And, uh, and the, there are, uh, lots of uh, things that enable them to also cooperate. And it is in this framework that uh, 
I had this very early dream in which, uh, you know, I was working on swarms of, on, on, on colonies of ants. And I said, uh, why not have a swarm of drones that are autonomously maintaining cohesion? They are flying in the, in the air like a flock of birds or like a swarm of, uh, of locusts. And they avoid collisions by local algorithms that are in between them and do all kinds of things. And um, what, they, uh, what they form is that they form a flexible and, uh, and easily modified global shape cloud of, of agents that are not in any rigid or pre-programmed formations. So people were talking about formations, but I wanted these, uh, uh, this form of drones to be completely self-organizing and self-arranging themselves. However, keeping cohesion, keeping a certain uh, maximal distance uh, uh, between, between each of them, but, but, but not going beyond that. Uh, these um, um, this draw this uh, 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 this whole uh, this whole concept would be a, a, a flexible cloud that is controlled by one single external entity that sees the cloud. Okay, from far away I could see the cloud of of agents that are under my uh, under my uh, control and I can guide this form and tell it what to do by broadcasting some signals not to any each each uh, to any one of these agents in particular but to the cloud as such so I don't I will not need to know the names of every drones I they don't have to be they don't have to be uh, identifiable. They are just entities that are identical and they are doing something like by themselves. And I, uh, uh, in the next uh, slide, you can see um, uh, uh, a picture of how I, I pictured myself controlling uh, this swarm of, of drones and just making them do some interesting uh, dance and path in the air like a like a, like a flock, flock of birds. Now, uh, you people might ask, what would be the, the, the applications for such things? Well, there are, there are lots of applications for multi-agent robotics in disaster areas, in delivering things to, to, to areas which are very difficult to reach and so forth and so forth. So I regard this as a, as a fundamental as a fundamental capability that we have to have, that we'll have to have in the future, and uh, and I would like I would like this uh, thing to come through. And slowly in 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 2021, this dream is coming through, mostly through the work of uh, of my student Dave Dovrat, who uh, is both working on the on the algorithmic aspects of it, with, which are very, very interesting. And many people can work on the algorithmic aspects uh, by doing all kinds of simulations and assuming some, uh, assuming some, some capabilities. And, uh, um, and, and, and uh, uh, however, the biggest challenge, it turns out, the biggest challenge that we have encountered is that these agents, we don't, we don't yet have uh, these systems available and these agents to, to, to be able to do what, uh, whatever, whatever is needed. So at this point, uh, 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 I'm going to hand over to Dave Dobra to describe for you uh, both this Nemala Alate system that he's designing he will tell you a little bit about the algorithmic aspects and the theoretical work that he has done to, 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 uh, to address this problem. And 
and and and uh, we'll show you some very early practical deployments of the system that Dave is working on. So here it is. I'm I'm handing it over to Dave Dovra to continue the work. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'm uh, putting on the show. So hang on for a second. I'm sharing. Uh, as a prerequisite to uh, what we're going to talk about, uh, the, um, the title of this talk is about the framework. But as a prerequisite, let's talk some about uh, an example algorithm that does what uh, Freddie just uh, talked about, which does uh, cohesive uh, swarming as, uh, as a unit, as a cloud, for uh, indistinguishable uh, uh, identical agents. So at the basis of the algorithm is the single agent. The single agent point of view is, we see here uh, a dot, which is a beacon. It's like an agent for, uh, that doesn't move and an agent. And what the agent does, if we let them run, if you can see it, is whenever the beacon gets into the agent's field of view, the, field, uh, the agent uh, turns with a, bigger radius, of, with a bigger turning radius. And whenever the uh, beacon slips out of the uh, agent's limited field of view, the field of view here being uh, 45 degrees in this example, whenever it slips out of its field of view, it, uh, the agent turns in a smaller turning radius. This causes a, a pattern in its trajectory, which uh, makes it approach the, uh, the, the beacon uh, slowly yet surely, as we can see uh, right here. This is what the single agent does. This is the algorithm. Now, if we take the same algorithm and run it in a different scenario in which there are no beacons, instead we have eight agents. And here goes. We'll make it run a bit faster. So what we see is that they form eventually, let's clear the drawing for a moment. They eventually uh, develop a pattern which puts them all in a circular formation. And at this point, we can actually do some interesting things like uh, introduce a leader probability. If we introduce a broadcasting single, say 30% of the agents will hear the broadcast of North, which I started now, then we see that the entire flock moves in that general direction. I can now change it to West and we see that this actually works, luckily, because this is a live demo. And if we take the drawing out, we can also take one of the agents and force this uh, uncooperative uh, uh, agent to become a leader, and then we see the rest following. So this is one uh, uh, algorithm that performs as uh, uh, true to our paradigm that uh, Freddie uh, uh, talked about earlier. And uh, in order to take this, and I'll stop sharing now, in order to take this type of algorithm from the net logo simulation that we just saw and into uh, the real world with actual uh, flying robots, we uh, uh, developed the following uh, framework called the uh, Nemala L8. This is a framework that uh, is written mostly in uh, C++ with uh, some parts of it made in Python for uh, easier adoption by uh, the uh, final ultimate application developers that we are uh, trying to target as a market. Uh, so what exactly is uh, Nemala L8? Nemala, for uh, those of you who don't know Hebrew, it's uh, an ant and L8 is a flying ant. So um, what exactly is it? It's a framework. It's a framework that is, uh, uh, that is based on these components. Each and every one of the components that we see here is, 
is running, it could be, uh, they could all be running on the same platform using inter uh, process communication. They could be distributed over a few uh, physical nodes and communicate through uh, TCP. And each of them has a responsibility and every responsibility we'll go into, we'll delve into it uh, now, uh, but each and every one of them handles, uh, they are event driven, they handle some sort of an event and these are uh, the, uh, the interfaces between them and we'll go into uh, which, what each of them does and why we think this is a valuable uh, framework. So the first, uh, the first uh, component I want to go into is the high level control. This is an abstraction uh, that uh, abstracts away the actual uh, UAV. Uh, it has all the logic that is required to, uh, uh, as an intermediate between the mission control and the actual autopilot that actually does the low level control and, and drives uh, uh, the UAV motors. We have an operator station client, which is uh, actually uh, an abstraction of an operator as anything that has uh, these uh, interfaces. They are the commands like take off, uh, uh, land, uh, move to some direction, other, the, operation, the operator payload could be any message you want to give to any other uh, uh, component in the, in the uh, system. Uh, the high level control uh, can uh, uh, publish its uh, telemetry and platform errors and they have a state and the operator could be uh, could be uh, autonomous, could be just uh, an operator that provides the expected uh, uh, interfaces and uh, uh, subscribes to the other uh, interfaces. But we went ahead and implemented an HTTP uh, 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 client that can uh, uh, anonymously uh, um, call a server somewhere on the cloud using DNS and once it starts communicating with the server, it can get operator uh, commands from any user using uh, UI. And after the talk, I will uh, uh, share the open source with all of you. So that's what the operator uh, station uh, client does. And the mission control ha has logic that, uh, that stands between the operator station client and the operator commands what the human in the system wants the system to do and between the high level control which is the platform and what the platform does so in the middle there's the mission control and uh, the extension point that makes the framework extendable is the behavior model arbiter the behavior model uh, the behavior module arbiter arbiters between different behaviors according to the mission control state. So the states could be, and we'll uh, look into it in a second, the state could be uh, the mission is now performing takeoff. So we don't want any behavior to send any uh, velocity commands to the motors because it might, uh, it might uh, cause problems to uh, taking off. So if we're in uh, open to do a mission, then we have a model uh, a behavior module arbiter that chooses which behavior runs at each point of each mission and can itself also you can uh, cascade them so different uh, behaviors actually run different behaviors. So this is the extension point of the framework. Uh, beyond that extension point there's also the uh, high level control which is uh, 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 it uses a strategy design pattern that you can uh, use different uh, uh, platforms as the uh, low level control, uh, the abstraction. So this right here is the, uh, the um, component uh, diagram of the actual uh, algorithm that we saw earlier in simulation. So what we have here is how the behavior actually works. So uh, in the end, it sends the velocity uh, 
it, it, the, the radius in which it's going to turn is a velocity command that the high level control subscribes to. Uh, in the simulation, which we're going to see a uh, software in the loop by uh, Arducopter, uh, we use the operator payload to tell it whether it sees, whether it has other uh, agents in its field of view, because I have to simulate the field of view. And also I get the direction command from the operator through uh, this uh, interface right here. And uh, for the simulator also, in order to know if I'm actually seeing or not seeing another, uh, uh, it's not for that, it's for the direction command, I need to know which uh, azimuth I'm uh, looking towards. And for that, I also subscribe the behavior to the telemetry. So this is how the actual final application looks like. But as a framework, this is the framework. So uh, what is all this good for? So here we see on the left-hand side, the uh, logic going into the mission control, and on the right-hand side, the logic going into the high-level control. And in the uh, video we're going to see shortly, we're going to see how they work in tandem in order to uh, lift off the ground uh, UAV. So the point is to simplify the uh, writing UAV applications to the end, uh, uh, to the ultimate uh, application developer. So we provide through the framework all the logic required to put a UAV up in the air. So other people that want to generate applications won't have to uh, be uh, bothered with it. Uh, also, uh, this framework runs easily on uh, Raspberry Pi. We started development on the version uh, two. Now uh, there, are, uh, there are more uh, more powerful raspberries out there, but uh, it runs fine on even uh, uh, not so strong platforms. And uh, we left a plugin mechanism in order for uh, new people, new uh, developers to write new behaviors so they can write it in Python, they can run uh, uh, autopilot also in Python. We made it easier in order for it to be more uh, adoptable, or at least we tried. And also uh, inside the logic is some, uh, uh, some uh, safety measures, such as uh, uh, the taking off sequence. Uh, we go through a checklist before to see that this is even possible to uh, take off. And if not, then the user gets uh, notified. And also uh, through the behavior uh, module, we, the end user in the end needs through a, a, a configuration file, a text file, it doesn't need to recompile, but uh, the user needs to explicitly enable a behavior in order to run in a, a given system state. This way we can uh, guarantee or at least uh, delegate the, the uh, responsibility to the end user and have them uh, uh, use the uh, framework as safely or unsafely as the as they choose. Also, uh, we can uh, we we can use the fact that we have some uh, platforms already developed and that we open the uh, uh, architecture, so other people can also uh, write for more uh, autopilots. Currently, we have the uh, uh, DJI uh, Telos and uh, Arducopter. Uh, for Pixhawk family uh, and uh, autopilots, but uh, people can uh, extend the UAV if they want, uh, the, the framework if they want to, uh, to handle more. And uh, either way, once the uh, behavior is developed, it can be deployed on uh, a variety of uh, UAVs. Arducopter itself uh, alone uh, handles a huge amount of uh, different platforms. And uh, also we can use uh, a software in the loop simulation uh, from uh, using that uh, framework. So uh, now I'll show you a, a quick uh, demonstration because we still have a few minutes and I'm gonna talk through it. So uh, this was uh, of course uh, 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 developed uh, at the Technion. Here we can see the sequence of the state machines uh, as uh, the uh, drones take off. 
uh, work started on this uh, framework at the Technion Autonomous Systems Program, and it continues now in the Computer Science Department. Right here, we can see uh, the software in the loop, the Arducopter CITL uh, uh, simulation running the uh, algorithm that I showed you previously on a NetLogo simulation. And now the user pressed return to launch. And after they all landed safely, they returned to the ready standby for a next mission. Here we see uh, a demonstration where I flew four, attempted to fly four uh, uh, drones by myself. Uh, the first uh, one that didn't take off, it didn't take off because it didn't have enough GPS coverage. The second landed because it had a critical failure and it returned to launch autonomously uh, due to uh, low current in the motors. And the remaining two flew and now we can see that they also performed their uh, uh, video recording uh, mission. And as you can see on the bottom right, I'm nowhere near the remote control or the laptop that controls them. I was just running with my phone filming them. Uh, here in the laboratory, I'm running DJI Telos, which is uh, much more uh, comfortable uh, in terms of uh, <laughs> how scared I was. You see, I'm pretty uh, not scared here and uh, the drones just fly and uh, everything is very nice. And you see that they are also performing the exact same uh, mission of uh, recording video as uh, you could see here on the top. And uh, I think I still have one minute for questions. So I will stop sharing now and try to answer. Yeah, thank you, Dave, and thank you, uh, Freddy, for this interesting presentation. We have already one question from uh, Rao Fu. Uh, the, his question is, is how to ensure collision avoidance according to the proposed model for drones? Uh, so for this framework, you can either have the behavior, the algorithm running, perform collision avoidance, like... Uh, as, as, a, as a result of running the, the algorithm that is running in the, uh, uh, and the, as the behavior, but also you can use a, a standalone uh, collision detector and resolver as a behavior, and then have other behaviors uh, subscribe to that uh, state, to that topic. So if you cascade the behavior uh, modules, you can use each and every one of them as a, a traffic officer for the next uh, nested uh, behavioral model. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Uh, I didn't fully, uh, fully understand that, but I, I want I sure I want to ask Freddie one question. Uh, so I skip to this question. Uh, um, so the question is that you describe something like, uh, you call it uh, controlled uh, by the cloud or uh, it's more like centralized control, right? This is what I understand from you. It's a centralized control it from a base not, station. Yeah, it, it is centralized in the sense that there is one point, one controller, okay? So there is one guy that controls these things. However, as opposed to Many things that we are seeing nowadays deployed in, in all kinds of movies and, uh, and, and, and events where drones are flying, we are relinquishing the, the need, uh, we are relinquishing the, 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 the necessity to actually be able to target each of those drones in, 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 uh, individually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are flying the, the cloud in the air and we are relying on the fact that they know how to arrange themselves in such, uh, and to move in such a way that they are not going to uh, collide and they are not going to, uh, to go fa too far away from each other. So the, these, these, are in, these are embedded in the algorithms. So these drones, because they have, they are sort of autonomous, they have local sensors, they see each other, they, they, they see each other, not, not all, of, all of them, but their neighborhood. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just do some kind of a general uh, overall uh, broadcast control to them. So I'm going to tell them, 
okay, now go a little bit higher, okay? So now if one of my drones hears this and the rest doesn't, and it doesn't matter which one of the drones is hearing it, he will, he will tend to go higher and the other drones are going to follow because they want to keep the cohesion, okay? okay. So, so, the, so, so, so when you do this, uh, this broadcast control, you are, you are sending a signal towards the cloud and you don't know which three or four drones are going to hear this, uh, this, this, this signal. Maybe all of them will hear and that's very good because then the whole thing will drift in that direction immediately. But if only two of them will hear, then perhaps much slower at a slower pace, but they still go into, into the right direction. That's the, that's the beauty of it. Okay. Now it's much more clearer. So the beauty of the of, of the the beauty of this of this system and of this idea is that you are letting them live like an autonomous uh, self-organizing entity. Okay, but 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 this is not a rigid formation. This is a cloud which is which is like fluid in the air, like a, like a, like a yeah. flock of. Of, uh, of birds and then you as a controller you know where they are because you look at them yes in a passive way and you can tell them now go to the right or now go to the left no go up no go down and all kinds of things like this and this is beautiful you know this is my dream my dream is to to have this flock of birds that i can control like uh, like uh, like a child is controlling his uh, his kite. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. I hope that you will uh, <laughs> you will accomplish your dream. But I, I you will do it in the so, lab. Yes, so yes. okay. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so through through the work of Dave, we shall achieve this. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. We move to the next uh, uh, speaker. So the next speaker is uh, Robin David. Uh, sorry, Robin David, and uh, he is a subject matter expert uh, for the NAMA initiative, Matrix, from Matrix IT. And uh, the title of his uh, presentation is Urban Area Mobility uh, Today, NAMA's in, uh, initiative, and tomorrow. So, Dror, floor is yours. Uh, my name is Dror Ben David, as was already mentioned. I've been 27 years in the Israeli Air Force. Uh, commanding F-16 and F-15 squadrons and uh, the head of uh, operational requirement department working for Matrix IT in the last 15 years and uh, uh, graduate of physics in the Technion uh, from the education point of view. Uh, during uh, January 2020, which is about a year ago, uh, we conceived the National Government Steering Committee consisting of five different organizations, which include the Ministry of Transportation, Ilon Highways as, as the performing organization, Prime Minister Office, the Smart Mobility, uh, Directorate, Israel Innovation Authority, and uh, the Civil Aviation Authority, which is the regulator and the lawmaker. And ever since then, uh, we are uh, actually uh, operating multiple uh, drone activities in the altitude section of the very low level as it is defined both in the uh, United States by the FAA and the European Union by ASA, which is 50 meters above the ground up to 122 meters above the ground, which is 400 feet. Uh, I will uh, try to humbly uh, present to you what we are doing. Uh, we are now uh, concluding our first uh, phase of uh, large activity aiming to uh, define, understand, understand the requirements and see what we can do with respect to UTM, which means the UAV traffic management capabilities in the VLA. Next slide, please. Uh, the idea is to uh, facilitate a national network of delivery drones. We started with delivery drones in order to be able to dictate for the different companies uh, their routes meaning that uh, we would like at first stages to be in control of what every uh, company is doing. 
We are aiming to have a full-blown ecosystem in the sense uh, that we would like to support all business verticals within less than two years in such a way that all uh, stakeholders will be able to be profitable uh, to include the uh, air operator certificate holder, the, 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 the licensed pilots, and so on and so forth. And the next stage is entering the urban air taxi services. And by that, I mean that we would like to conclude within 2021 uh, a research aiming to understand what, how, what and how will it contribute uh, to Israel to have a fully uh, capable air taxi capabilities. Hopefully this will be supported uh, by the Prime Minister office. And uh, I was very impressed with the first presentation and I think it will be very helpful to uh, better define what this research will be. Uh, assuming that the answer will be that there is some sense of doing that, we want June 2022 to already start flying with one of the five leading companies doing uh, UAM for passenger uh, uh, support. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'll, I'll simply go through what we are already doing uh, in order uh, for, for you to uh, get acquainted with. On our first contract, uh, a company, which is an AOC, an air operator, showed up with this uh, drone. It's very interesting because uh, counterintuitively, it's an um, Israeli-made drone. The white uh, antenna on the top of it, is, it means that it has only one uh, GPS receiver. Uh, it receives naturally only one constellation, meaning GPS, Baidu, uh, Galileo, uh, GLONASS, and so forth. It, it, gets only the, G, uh, the uh, American GPS. And the company that showed up flew it in radio control as if it's a hobby. Next slide, please. Uh, building the ecosystem, we are, we are following 10 different vectors. These include encouraging different companies uh, uh, to certify themselves as air operators. Israel currently have and 160 companies that are already um, AOC approved by CAI. I think it's, it's quite a large number. About 12 of them are doing uh, drone deliveries. Most of them are doing just aerial photography for different um, uh, users. We are supporting uh, customers. The issue here is that most customers don't realize that it's already available for them. And when I'm saying customer is the national mail, uh, the different malls, hospitals, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, most public doesn't realize that it's already here and can be deployed. So we are helping uh, evolving different business cases and develop them, changing and, and adapting the required regulation uh, through the help of uh, the CAI. Uh, my, my, the, the reason that I wanted uh, to display to, to present to you these days is because I think we are very uh, weak in Israel with respect to research and development. And my own interest in this uh, presentation is that uh, some of the, of the better researchers will join us in doing uh, uh, some uh, research activity aiming to help this uh, government initiative. We're supporting local manufacturing, and as I've, as I've shown on the last uh, slide, so there are some Israeli companies who are doing different parts of, of the UAVs themselves, doing the command and control part of it and the UTM part of it. So there are a lot of activities with respect to manufacturing. We are working with uh, YASA in Europe, FAA and NASA in, in the United States, and the World Economic Forum through uh, the Innovation Authority of Israel, part of the C4I initiative, which Israel is a part of. Uh, we are working with India, uh, New Zealand, Switzerland, and few other uh, nations, um, sharing information and understanding what each of us is doing, Singapore to mention. And uh, in Israel, there is a, a trick which I was not aware of called innovation communities. These uh, communities are, uh, are uh, excellent center or centers for specific uh, industry verticals, such as health uh, establishments, and we are working with them. It's very helpful with respect to the public acceptance, which as far as I understand, 
is considered to be one of the largest obstacles, meaning that uh, how can we uh, get the public trust that all these uh, inno innovations are uh, something useful and not harmful, as it was mentioned again in the first lecture. And everything has been uh, coordinated through a Gantt, which is very flexible for, uh, from our point of view. And, when we ever, and whenever we are stuck, we simply change our way, end, ending the end game, having a full-blown ecosystem, uh, profitable to all participants, aiming uh, to uh, complete that and be able uh, to withdraw funding by the government because everybody will be profitable within two years from now, which is a total program of three years. Next slide, please. Uh, that's again, this is a geriatric hospital, the one that we, uh, first we flew. And here again, you see that, uh, the, uh, let's call it a drone port. And that was our first uh, drone port ever being built in, in out in the wild, so to speak. Next slide. There are different uh, activities and different difficulties uh, with respect to how the government can, uh, can uh, actually employ its uh, dreams for the different companies. We need contracts for them and so on and so forth. So we are doing uh, five different routes. First of all, in order to uh, facilitate the capability to fly, we launched a, a buildup of a network of air routes. We already have that for, I think, about a fifth of the country. These routes, again, are in the VLL, in the, in the very low level altitude, 400 feet above sea level, above ground level and up to the minimum of 50. And uh, this is already uh, established and published along the different uh, rules of the air. So each pilot who comes to Israel can see it. Uh, when COVID started, we, uh, established, we uh, published a tender and we're under this tender selected eight different eligible companies, which we can now, without additional tender, uh, put them to work in a short notice. And that's what we did during 2020, where, when we established circa 700 sorties flying in hospitals. Flying in hospitals allowed us to fly uh, only one aircraft uh, in one place with a segregated airspace, which is easier from the point of view of regulation. Uh, uh, the, the phase that we are currently ending these two weeks is a call for proposal published by the Innovation Authority for 12 million shekels, 50% of that funded by the government, where we selected five different companies and this is to facilitate flying many companies in the same geographical area without a pre-decided uh, separation, building the comfort of UTM. And uh, if during 2020, we flew 700 sorties, as I mentioned, the last six days we flew 1437. So it's, it's at least 10 times the number and we hope to keep the pace. Uh, the tender for the uh, UTM establishment, the, the steady state UTM establishment is already out and we're waiting for the national budget for that to happen. And we're establishing for uh, circa 30 million uh, shekels, which is a um, $10 million long five years plan a test range or experimental field in the city or the town of Yerucham in the Negev, where we would like to test all new uh, capabilities which cannot be tested above uh, dense urban environments. Next slide, please. Israel has many uh, difficulties, but at times it's, uh, it's, uh, you can convert them into advantages. What you see here, is uh, uh, the black dots are all the train stations. And what we are showing that if we uh, fly from a, any train station to the smaller radius circles, it's quite a small part of the country. And I mentioned the five kilometers radius because of the current same at 600 by DJI uh, drones and so on. But the moment that we will uh, uh, embrace inside the 25 kilometers drone, which is already feasible, 
uh, we can cover all of Israel and that can be done in a few months. So our capability to uh, achieve a full-blown uh, coverage of the whole state is, uh, is uh, tangible. We can do it in a few months and we already have in place the different uh, uh, treaties, so to speak, between us and the train. And we already demonstrated that we are capable of flying drones from hospital to the nearest train station, take the parcel, uh, uh, drive, or, or uh, I don't know how you say it, but uh, use the train, get to the other side of the country, and then take it again with the drone to the destination. Then this way we can cover a limitless range all over Israel. Next slide, please. Next slide. What you're seeing here, it, we started, uh, as I mentioned before, flying a geriatric hospital, Vilos, which was, a, 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 if I may say, a poor start, but this was the company that showed up on our first contract. Uh, later on, we moved, uh, this is a, a psychiatric hospital, which is very loud. It's, it's about uh, 1.5 kilometers in length and separated compartments. And this allowed us to establish the Bivilos rules. And now we have three companies who are already certified to fly beyond visual uh, line of sight. We started with the radio control, as you've seen on the previous slide. And now we're flying fully autonomous, but autonomous in the sense that the mission is planned, approved by the UTM, and then injected into the uh, drone. The drone has to uh, report its position at least um, once in a second. So it's, it's autonomous in the sense that it flies mission, but it's not autonomous in the sense that it has to report its position and we can uh, change its uh, routes and so on and so forth. Uh, everything is being done through the cellular networks via LTE. So we have full coverage in Israel and we can fly globally from the same uh, command and control center. Uh, and uh, we decided to dictate that uh, because Israel is uh, susceptible to GSS uh, denial by the Russians or locally or different other reasons, uh, we decided to dictate that all civilian UAVs uh, and drones flying with VLL have to demonstrate their capability to fly safely without GNSS. We concluded that last February in the test range, and we have that capability now too. We can talk about that later if it's of any interest. Next slide, please. What we are seeing here that we moved from the single uh, GNSS to uh, three receivers configuration. For flying above people, it's mandatory to have a, a FTS parachute and it's already deployed. Uh, and we are moving to uh, two very interesting and important bricks in bricks in bricks in the wall, if you will, if you like. One of them is uh, in order to um, improve the accuracy of landing. Instead of landing according to GPS only, we uh, uh, introduced uh, optical homing. So we got it down from circa. Uh, five meters, if you want 99.9% .9 of the landings to be accurate, uh, it's five meters and it's quite poor. When you do optical uh, homing, you can get up to uh, about 20 centimeters and deploying the drones in a cocoon so they can withstand the, the weather and they don't need an operator which will uh, manually uh, take it off and take it down. Next slide, please. Uh, we invested quite much uh, analyzing uh, what will the building effect will be, both from the point of view of uh, micro uh, weather, mainly winds, and the GNS availability. From that respect, we found out that the most important part is what, uh, what uh, share of the sky can you actually see, so you'll be able to uh, receive enough satellites. Currently, all our, all our uh, drones are using three constellations. So, uh, uh, roughly speaking, we have a continuous reception of 15 to 22, 21 satellites continuously. And it is much better than the five that I'm used to uh, with jet fighters, which is quite poor when you look at these capabilities now. Next slide, please. 
June 2020, as I mentioned, we moved from radio control to LTE. We moved from uh, visual line of sight to beyond visual line of sight. We were not allowed, and now we are allowed to fly above people. And uh, from the point of view of economical sustainability, the most important part, I uh, think, is the ability of the pilots, what I call a designated UAV operator here, uh, uh, to fly many different drones, because otherwise you will not, uh, we will not, not be able to compete with bicycles and, and motorcycles. And from all those uh, aspects, we already moved forward. We accomplished 700 sorties, as I mentioned. During 2021, we plan to do 6,000 sorties. This will be flown along two, uh, uh, two weeks at the end of each quarter. And this will allow us to multiply by 10 our number of sorties each year for the coming, as I mentioned, three years starting from January 2020, which if the government will continue to support that brings Israel to the to what I believe is, is the number of drones and sorties uh, capable to support the current demand. Uh, UTM wise, the idea is to uh, deploy an integrated, updated and accurated air picture, which includes uh, all non-cooperative drones. This is currently flying in the current demonstration, as I already mentioned, and we uh, will fortify it along the coming two years. Next slide, please. The idea is that under current regulation, Israel is part of uh, Eurocontrol. So when you want to fly a 737 to Paris from Tel Aviv, you need to uh, ask for a flight approval at least seven days prior to the, to the right establishment within IAA. They, they move the request to uh, Eurocontrol and they give you a time slot. And it's obligatory to do that seven uh, days prior, which is totally irrelevant for a drone that wants to uh, deliver hamburger on a one minute notice. So our current UTM supports less than 10 seconds uh, for flight approval, assuming that the, the flight plan does not contradict any existing rules or no fly zones. The system provides strategic uh, deconflicting, deconfliction, which means that if your flight plan uh, uh, contradicts the current laws or the current no fly zones, or, or it, uh, it is a collision course with other company, the system will alert you and give you an option to select how to uh, uh, build back the, the safety margins. And tactical deconfliction means that the same thing can be done uh, near real time while the drones are airborne and all these capabilities are already in place. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we would like men, if it was to uh, be part of the Israeli airspace, uh, starting 2022, if uh, Daniela will help us support the needed re uh, uh, research during this year. Next slide, please. This is the existing, which I just came from. That's why I'm talking from cellular phones. This is the existing, what we call Metropolitan Drone Services Center, already in place in Haifa City. Next slide. What you see here is the, the way that we did the, the risk buildup. We started with the blue polygons where each company flew by itself and only over, over above uh, agricultural fields. So if there are any drone crashes, there is no harm. We did that for one day. On the second day, we multiplied the number of sorties. And on the third day, we started flying without a segregation between the companies. Next slide. What you see here, if you look closely, it's quite interesting. The blue lines is the lines that we used for the first day in order to separate between the companies. And, and between the two lines, it's uh, uh, highway number two in Israel, which is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, four lanes uh, to each side. It's a major highway. And as far as I know, the FOV already uh, uh, granted only three permits to cross it, and we do it multiple times. On the right side, what you see in the vertical line is a railway and the forest starting uh, in the middle and going to the right is a forest where our, uh, our uh, uh, National Park Authority dictated that we are not allowed to fly it because there are birds 
testing there. And the green lines that you see are the different routes and the two UAVs, the, the purple one on the bottom and the green one upwards is 130 meters apart flying head on. So it's, a, and these are two uh, actual flights, it's not simulated. Uh, you, you can see here that we have uh, the capability to fly head on with two different uh, drones 130 meters apart without uh, geo separation where each drone is flown by different company. It's above and in between the railway and highway. And simultaneously to that, we are flying circa 21 uh, drones in each sortie, 15 times a day, uh, 300 sorties per day total. Next slide, not to include the simulations. That's an, another Israeli made drone. This one is being used for security and deploys loudspeaker and flashlight. Next slide, please. Same one, different angle, different lighting. Next slide. And during this current demonstration, we are, one of the company chose already to do delivery. And what you're seeing is the Agadir uh, company uh, using the drones in order to deploy hamburgers on a, on a minute notice. Next, next slide. And as always, you're probably familiar with this phenomena. There was a huge uh, pressure from the media. So we took 10 different uh, drones and showed them that we'd fly them simultaneously. It's of course just a show off because this slide uh, looks at drones that are being flown in radio control and doesn't have anything to do with, with the actual thing. And the actual thing we do allow uh, drones within the UTM, a minimum 60 meters uh, safety clearance. Next slide, please. And why did we, uh, from my point of view, gather here? We are lacking R&D arm in Israel. At least I didn't get any help with all that uh, activity that I just mentioned. And we would like very much that PhDs and smart people will get into it and do uh, an in-depth researches. Most of the researches that I see uh, are not where I think um, that is uh, of high value for the near future, and we need uh, different works for the near future. For instance, we didn't do anything seriously academic-wise with respect to the infrastructure required, which I believe will be a major uh, uh, challenge for us. And there are many other uh, different issues. For instance, uh, each and, of, and every manufacturer of a drone uh, measures differently the, the altitude and a lot of other issues. Next slide, please. Well, it's 8, 6 p.m. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Dora, for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, let's see if there is any question here. So I have a question meanwhile. Uh, actually, um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to see the conclusion that um, there are also still works and research work to do in some uh, important issues that you uh, need to deal with the future. So maybe we open here an option also uh, for uh, maybe future collaboration with the uh, academy uh, and so on. But my question is, you didn't talk about uh, the traffic management. Can you, ex how you manage uh, 300 uh, drones in the future or more traveling together? So you saw, you showed the control uh, center or the videos, but can you explain a little bit about the algorithmic behind it? Yes, well, what I think that that's what the part that, that I talked about the gap between academy and, and the actual practices. At least my understanding is that the, the reason that the drones will fly is because someone asks it in the, in the commercial sense. For instance, if it's a hamburger delivery, someone will ask the hamburger. So you can't, it's not the flying in swarms. They don't fly in swarms. They fly, each drone flies in order to fulfill a specific mission that the, that the end customer paid for. So the question becomes, how can we control, it's not 300, drones, currently it's 20 drones flying 300 sorties. And I think that for the coming five years, at least Israeli uh, cities will not have more than those. We, the question becomes, how can we fly say 10, 20 or 30 drones 
each of them flying for a different, so to speak, mission, but it's not a mission. It's, it's an end customer that asked for something in a safe manner. And for that, we already established what will be the safety and margins, what will be the altitude separa separation that we allow. And the DUTM continuously calculates uh, the near future to see if there are any uh, uh, expected um, lack of safety margins. And if there are such, it alerts. It gives the different visas, the, 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 the command and control, the companies who are actually flying the drones, three options how to uh, change the routes in order to solve it. And if they don't, uh, they, they, it instructs them to uh, uh, hover. And it's as simple as that. But there are a lot of difficulties and it's far from being optimized. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope that you will have uh, the ability to stay to the last lecture because maybe I also in my lecture will uh, talk about this a little bit more. Maybe we can discuss further in four eyes later on. Okay, thank you very much, Dror. There is no more question uh, here. So I move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, and the next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Kwan Kwan from Bihang University. And the title of his uh, lecture is How Far Two EVTOLs uh, Should Be Subject to Communication Uncertainties. Hi, thank you. Thank you for Jack's invitation. It's, it's pleased to come here to give uh, such a talk. I'm from China. Uh, first, I will show what you will learn uh, in the following uh, maybe uh, 15 minutes or to 20 minutes. First, of all, I will show you uh, a new idea uh, namely Sky Highway, which is for dense, dense uh, traffic uh, for, for the uh, evictors or your ways. The second, I will, uh, secondly, I will show a sep separation principle, which can decompose control design and uh, communication uncertainty, uncertainties. Uh, certainly, I will show uh, the safety radios subject to communication uncertainty. I think if you come from uh, the government uh, or companies, you, you, are maybe, you may be interested in a sky highway or the, or the safety radios. If you are from uh, from academic area, uh, such as control, uh, control area, you may be, you are interested in separation principle. First, let's move to Sky Highway. First, I will show uh, a video. I think UAM is more powerful than us. This video is, is uh, it happened early July uh, 2019. I visited uh, my friend. Uh, my friend, uh, he, is, uh, he was, he is, as a CEO of a company, company named Enwalk, uh, the company is uh, is focusing focusing on the UAM uh, delivery uh, parcel uh, to 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 people. From then on, they, they at least they have the ability to to offer the service. Uh, we get the drink from the sky. It's, uh, it's, uh was an uh, impressive experience to get a drink. But oh, I also, I noticed some problems. Uh, because the air traffic flow is very low, so the airway was very simple, uh, at least uh, as uh, 2019. Two Jones cannot, uh, does not share one airline at the same time. I think, it, this is a waste of uh, waste of airspace because uh, if we have more and more drones in the sky, I think this way it doesn't work. Similarly, I think sorry. Similarly, uh, ATM for civil aviation is not suitable for uh, UAM as well because the number is least large, the size is small, and the task is complex. Because of the size is small, um, such as the uh, surveillance uh, system 
for ATM cannot, it's not easy for, for them to detect, uh, detect uh, your waste. Also, we can use, use uh, continue to use human-centered way to manage so many your ways. For such a purpose, uh, the USA and the uh, European Union uh, have the, both uh, have the, uh, the, the plan to develop uh, a new framework and to, for, for the future air traffic. Uh, also, we also have an, a new idea, namely Sky Highway. And next, we will show you uh, show you a video. Uh, the voice, the sound maybe is not clear, but fortunately, we have the subtitle. Uh, we also uh, cooperated with another company uh, to to realize the Sky Highway on the software. Uh, this is a video. Uh. So, uh, this is a location and this this uh, airway. We we uh, put the takeoff point and the landing point. We will track uh, a a John, uh, this John, uh, fly from the takeoff point to the the landing point. All 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 the uh, airways uh, on the airways can make avoidance uh, with each other autonomously. Okay. Uh, all controllers for Sky Highway were designed uh, in a communication uncertainty-free uh, situation, but I think it's not practical because uh, the the airways in the sky 
communicate with each other uh, through uh, wireless uh, network. So we have to uh, want to handle this uncertainty. So just first, let's let's see how to decide the safety distance in highway. Uh, the distance is used to used for uh, collision avoidance. Collision avoidance. The distance is 100 meters. Uh, if the car speed is greater than 100 kilometers per hour in China, I think, I think uh, the separation principle has been used implicitly. The government uh, assume the ability control ability of drivers, the drivers in 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 the car. Uh, it's a controller. Uh, they also set a uh, safety distance. Distance. The safety distance has taken uh, all the uncertainty into consider uh, consideration. Uh, combining them together, can then the safety can be guaranteed by the safety distance and uh, under the assumed control ability. So I think separation principle has been used uh, in place inspired by by this we we want to uh design the, the safety radios for for jobs in the sky before proceeding further let's learn about some 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 models this is a uav models we adopt a velocity control model uh, we say we say is a velocity command. Where is the velocity of your way? Uh, the parameter L is is control gain. Is the parameters? If if L is small, it is small. Uh, is small. That means the velocity of your way is will spend a long time to track uh, the the velocity command. So the L is is a parameter about the maneuverability. Uh, the VM is maximum speed. speed. This model is is very uh, general. Is general. The second next we will uh, we will define uh, uh, define the field to position field to position. Why? We define this uh, this position. Let's see the, this picture. In the three cases, two year we have the same distance, but obviously in the case B, two year we the two year ways has to make a avoidance as soon as soon as possible. Need need to make avoidance, or also to have the same distance. So I think. We think we, we should define a new uh, distance, namely filter position distance, distance which which uh, involves uh, the velocity here. So uh, our uh, city area uh, is based on the filter position. Let's see the picture uh, on the on the right. If when the UAV is static, uh, this is the Physical radius. This is the safety radius. It is bigger than the physical radius. This is the avoidance uh, area. If another uh, UAV ends into this area, uh, this UAV should make avoidance. But when UAV is moving, uh, we find that this is the safety area, this is the uh, avoid avoidance area uh, they are based on the field position and uh, not the position uh, based on field position this is very different it's different but the detection area and the physical uh, area is based on the position uh, okay then we let's uh, see the communication model uh, this is a general model uh, here, this model is equivalent to this model. This model is very general. 
uh, if the package is received, we use the 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 uh, the, uh, the real real value, but the the value ha has to be delayed be delayed because the communication uh, ha has delay. If the date is lost, we will use the uh, last value last value estimate at value. This is the a general communication model. And then we let's see some some distance. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, just the obstacle, just the your way, just the position error, position error. Just the filter position error, which uh, uh, include includes velocity. But because of uncertainty, this you will think this you will think it at here because uncertainty because estimate uh, uh, noise it think uh, it at here it think the optics because the communication and noise it think the obstacle at here. So in fact, we only use estimate filter position L as for the feedback used for control. We we control this this value, the this this distance keep away each other. This uh means this one, means this one. Okay. Okay, let's see the uh, separation principle of uh, here. We designed uh, safety radios. It keep keep that. This the estimate uh, field error. This the uh, real distance. Uh, this 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 principle to 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 design uh, the safety radios. This the controller design. Controller design in the control design we don't take communication and sending into consideration it's like the, the driver in in a car we we only define its ability its ability this is ability with them together we have the separation design serial to to get uh, this this prop probability it can ensure that the, the two euros can keep with each other you may ask uh what is the separation theory it is difficult to 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 show here i will give some result if uh for the cooperator evators or your ways uh, the separation principle holds for non-cooperate obstacles if uh, this is the, the maximal uh, velocity speed of your weight so this is the maximal maximal speed of obstacle the so two two value is uh is, is designed by the estimated noise and the communication noise it satisfies this uh inequality separation principle holds uh, uh, next, let's see the safety radius. This, this is the result we de derived. As we as shown, uh, if the probability of package loss is is ten to one, uh, this one will will be increased. If time delay is large, this one safety radius is increased. The noise is big. This one is increased. The velocity and the well, new vulnerability is small. This one is big. I think this is uh, is consistent uh, of of this right. I guess, but we we show this this uh, the relationship is right. We show this uh, equation exactly. Next, we show some simulation and experiments are fast. Uh, we do some perform uh, some uh, simulation uh, with uh, in three cases. In three cases, we only show the case B. 
these parameters, uh, this is some parameters. The dash uh, cycle is uh, the estimate uh, estimate uh, position. This is your way. Uh, this one is your way. Uh, this this one your way. As shown, as shown, uh, because we only use the estimate uh, error as feedback, so the dash dash cycle. Uh, uh, it's not uh, get uh, does not get together. This is about the uh, the the assumption on the communication model. Oh, if the separation theory is does not show does not hold, we also give an example that uh, uh, the. The estimated field position distance is less than the safety, less than the safety, uh, safety distance. Uh, this in, implies that the separation theory is 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 necessary. Is necessary. We also give uh, others uh, others uh, simulation to show the our theory. Okay. Uh, this this uh, there are some experiments experiments. This uh, parameters uh, here. Is satisfied by section. The cycle, uh, the dash the cycle is the the, the estimate position uh, from the the UA waste view, uh, from your waste view. Therefore, your waste uh, here. Okay, uh, I will sh uh, finally I will show the contribution of this talk. First, I will I show the sky highway is a new concept. I think. Uh, second, uh, we will show uh, the separation principle of control and the safety radios, uh, which can help, which will make control design easier. Uh, also, it can uh, it can help to. You can use the same controller with different different safety radios to to handle di different uh, communication uncertainty. Uh, thirdly, we we have a new filter a your way control model. Uh, then we derived derived safety radios uh, equations equations. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kwan Kwan. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time uh, for questions. Out of time, okay, so okay. if there is someone uh, has any question, he can contact uh, Kwan Kwan directly by email. Um, and then, um, actually, unfortunately, we don't even have enough time for my presentation. Um, so, can you relax uh, the screen? Can you stop sharing, Kwan Kwan? So we don't have uh, enough time for my presentation. I mean, it's uh, it's fine, given the fact that we have uh, answered several questions and we did uh, a lot of nice discussion. Uh, I just want to present in general the concept of my presentation or what I wanted to deal with uh, in two minutes and then uh, we finalize, uh, uh, we close the webinar. Uh, 
So the, actually, uh, the idea of my research in this work is how to model and control uh, large-scale urban air mobility systems. Um, Okay, um, so it's it's again it's not a secret that uh, the uh, the um, uh, penetration uh, of uh, low altitude passenger and delivery aircraft uh, are uh, increasing in the new uh, future. And my question is that this will in this will come up come up with the, with the new type of system we call it LAT systems, low altitude air city transport. And increasing the number of these aircraft will cause urban air traffic congestion in the air, uh, in the airspace. So these raise uh, new air traffic control uh, challenges. And here, my question is how we can investigate the collective behavior of all aircraft together in urban city and how or the ways of controlling the LAT systems. As a continuation of drawer, if you have a lot of drones, uh, as a continuation of the discussion with Ron, if you have a lot of drones of hamburgers are going in the city of Haifa, you need maybe to try to control it somehow in different level or uh, different altitude or other uh, type of uh, uh, possible, uh, possible options in managing. So we utilize the concept of uh, MFD uh, to model and uh, to control the large scale uh, network. Just to emphasize the difference between the current air transportation management um, scheme are different than the, the scheme that should be developed for uh, 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 urban air mobility. So the current air uh, transportation management scheme, of course, they are limited conventional uh, operation and they are based on centralized control structure, which imply um, rigid individual trajectory based operations in order to ensure uh, conflict detection and resolution uh, in their space. Uh, while the operation of future LAT system, they are expected to be more flexible, higher total number of daily short trips, more complex urban environment with energy consumption constraint, noise and weather consideration, and under congested traffic condition when you have some space uh, limitation for uh, traveling. Uh, and the important thing that uh, we need to deal with is also the hovering dynamics uh, that might happen in drones when you are entering a parking spot, for example, or queuing to entering a parking spot and so on. So there is also another issues related to uh, these such LAT systems because they are an example of um, modern a network control system. And once you model it as a network control system, you have typical issues that you need to deal with, like um, uh, problems or uh, vulnerability and uncertainty and failure in the communication and cyber attacks and etc. So when you deal with management in the future, you need to take also this into account. But here, what I wanted to emphasize as uh, a main concept that I'm trying uh, to uh, uh, to push in this area that we should not look at the uh, a, a, a aircraft or drones as individual uh, entities we should look at uh, uh, we should look uh, at them as a flows of aircraft traffic uh, and they should be controlled and for this uh, we have this mft concept um, some relation that can be used from the uh, uh, traffic urban uh, Vehicle, vehicle urban traffic that can be utilized or imported to uh, urban uh, air mobility. We need to use this uh, equation in order to introduce the model and then we design the controller. So the idea that if you have many drones that are going from one age to another age, eventually you can come up with a simulation and try to relate the relation between the flow, average flow and accumulation. So the number of drones inside this region. So if you take an urban area uh, and you increase the number of drones, uh, then the flow, the average flow will increase up to some point and afterwards 
after this, uh, the, the, the number will decrease, uh, as you can see here, because you'll have a lot of conflict and so on. So we prefer to stay here where we maximize an optimal number of drones in the area in order to optimize the, the performance of the whole system. So it's like a bird's view. You look as a control center, looks at all drones and try to uh, streak the number or regulate the number of drones inside uh, this area. So in order to do this, you need to come up with some structural design in the future above the air density. And of course, we propose some structural de design, look at uh, something like this, because this can take into account special elements of uh, aggregate modeling and also possible uh, control measures in the future. So you have uh, several layers, each layer you divide it to several regions and you can move uh, horizontally between regions and vertically from one region to another uh, layer in there. So for example, maybe uh, fast drones will be in, uh, in one layer and slower drones will be in another layer or drones are, uh, for uh, health use, for example, for hospitals in one layer and uh, taxi drones or other type of drones in other layer and so on. And then you need to move up from one region to another region. And each region can be aggregately modeled by this shape of MFD that we described earlier. Once you have this concept, you try to implement it. We have a lot of research uh, in the field of urban uh, signal control, uh, urban uh, system uh, with regular vehicular, uh, vehicular vehicles. So you can uh, impose this uh, research and try to uh, uh, model dynamically the number of vehicles or number of aircraft in each region, uh, in one region, and then you expand it to several regions, and you have a system, what we call system of multi-layer urban lat uh, systems. Then you have to bring a control, uh, controller or to design uh, a controller, uh, and because we have a lot of uncertainty and a lot of um, failures that can be happen, uh, then you need to adopt something related to adaptive control. So here we adopted like one control structure that can, uh, the gain can change or vary according to the parameter sensitivity. And because of we don't have much time, I just showed that we have some preliminary uh, simulation study that you have an urban region split it to uh, two layers, the first layer, two regions, and the larger layer, one uh, region. And then you have these three MFD shapes that aggregately model or connect the number of drones with the performance uh, in terms of flow, average flow for the whole urban region. Once you have this and implement it in the modeling, you can control the number in order to maximize the performance. And this is what you see here, error between the number of accumulation or number of drones inside the region and the target one goes to zero according to some, with some uncertainty, according to some controllers that you see here and they change over time. So the controllers, I didn't mention that, but the controllers are on the boundary. You can somehow ask them to change from one region to another region or wait on the boundaries and strict the number of drones to come inside these uh, boundaries. And with that, I think uh, I finish my presentation. And um, again, unfortunately, we don't have much time uh, for answering questions. Um, but again, this is fine because I think I learned a lot of uh, things from all the speakers. And there was a, lit, a very nice discussion, uh, very interesting uh, topics, various topics. And uh, for me, it was very helpful to see all these type of uh, talks uh, in different uh, domains. Uh, so, once again, I would like to thank all the speakers and uh, I would like to uh, also thank the ISDRC team that helped in organizing this uh, special webinar, uh, especially Tria uh, and Kathy. Uh, and um, and uh, see you in the next ISDRC uh, webinar. And with this, uh, I close the webinar. Thank you very much.